Okay, so can you all hear me? Is it okay? okay, so um, so this last uh, forty-five minutes, I'm trying to give you a sketch of the proof of the of the theorem, which I just stated in the previous uh, slide. So, and in a sense. So this, this theorem here, in which I'm trying to show that the singular, um, so at singular point, the polar lies in the wave curve. So a, a possible approach is to try to reduce to the situation of this example in which uh, my measure was one dimension, one directional in a sense. So the first example I gave it, but here. So in the case in which the measure mu has this form. So how is this possible? So let me, so take a measure mu. And the idea is like that if you zoom in around the generic point of this measure, say that I'm gonna call the origin soon, well, then in a sense, that's sort of a general principle, right? That measurable function should become almost constant when you, when you zoom in. So given a measure mu, I can, what I can do is to consider the following zooms somehow. So I fix a point at zero, which bit zero, a radius R, which is positive, and then I look to mu r, which is just, um, uh, well, it would be the push forward through the map e, well, x0 r of mu. So, but beside the definition of push forward, this is a measure whose measure, uh, which on a set A, the value is just my original mu on the set x0 plus r a, okay? So basically what I'm doing is that I'm taking a small ball of radius r around x0 and I'm zooming it to make the ball of radius one, okay? So that's essentially what I'm doing. So you see that through this map, if a is the ball of radius one, so the measure of mu r on the ball of radius one is the same that the measure of mu on the ball of radius r centered around x0. And uh, I'm gonna also do uh, divide. So this is, I mean, this might be a small quantity, right? So to make it more visible, I'm gonna divide by uh, the total mass of the small ball. So basically that's, I'm, I'm zooming around this point and I'm renormalized to see something in a sense. Okay, so in a sense, these measures are encoding the, the infinitesimal behavior of my measure around this point. And, uh, and the other things to note is that mu r, so r is a radon measure on the ball of radius one with values in V and the total mass of the ball of radius one is gonna be less or equal than one. So up to subsequences, so I mean, subsequences at least there is a series for each subsequences there is subsequence mu r are weakly start converging to some measure sigma right so which should somehow encode the infinitesimal behavior of mu r so now the issue would be is this sigma something which is non-trivial right it might happen that every time i do this procedure i get something which is trivial why not i mean the only information i have is that the mass well, actually for mu r, what I know is that this mass is one, but this is a, not an information that passes easily to the limit. So everything can somehow disappear to, to the boundary of the ball if, I, if I'm doing something like this. Uh, this would be the case, for instance, if, you, if your measure is became very, very fast towards the origin, right? So the question would be, is sigma different from zero? And the answer is yes at most point. So let me take this is an, so this type of things has been introduced as tangent measure by David Price in the eighties. And one of them, his main results is the following. So let's mu as above and mu r. Uh, so it should be mu x, but let's state this way. Then, at mu almost all x0, if we look to mu x0 r, this weak, 
um, say the following holds. Holds. Um, for each sequences rj going to zero, there exists a subsequence rj prime, such that if I look to mu x zero rj prime, this weekly star converge to a measure sigma with First of all, sigma is different from zero. Second, in a sense, sigma, what is happening here is that I can make, so these are vector valued measure, but in a sense, the, what, is, um, what is happening is that I'm freezing the polar of this measure faster than I'm con the, the scalar part converges. So what is happening is here is that sigma is of the form d mu over d mu in the point at zero, so the polar has been free, uh, frozen, times uh, nu, where nu is a positive scalar valid measure. Okay, so in a sense, the, 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 the direction freezes, so that the only thing which changes is this, uh, is this measure here. And uh, the third thing is that, okay, this is, um, This is a key point actually, which actually implies two. Maybe I'm gonna write in the next picture, in the next um, thing. So the third point is that at mu singular, almost all x zeros, what that, if you look to mu x zero r and you subtract, so you first freeze the polar, Um, and then you look to the dilation just of the singular part. While this two, this converges to zero, and it converges to zero in total variations. Okay, so this is like nothing but the integral. So this is basically what this is the integral of d mu over d mu x minus. Uh, it's, it's easy to see that this thing is basically the following. So it can be bounded by this. So I can integrate. So I freeze the polar and I integrate the measure and then I average. And this is, would be what happens here if I put instead of this, the, the full measure. So these things can be bounded by this. And uh, uh, I can, what happens if I don't put the full measure? So it would be something like this, mu s x zero r minus mu x zero r. So these are scalar valid measure, which I complete again. So this goes basically to zero in, because of Lebesgue density theorem. So, so Lebesgue point theorem. And this goes to zero because again, essentially by the back theorem, at mu singular all points, the singular part is predominant. So if you look to the ratio between the measure of the ball, the singular ball and the measure of the full ball, or the full measure of the ball, this goes to one, okay? So now you just write down what these things are and you realize that this quantity goes to zero. So in a sense, you see that freezing the polar, in a sense, you sort of faster freeze the polar. So, so let me stress that this convergence is just weak, okay? But in a sense, once, if you freeze the polar, so the, 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 what is responsible of the weak convergence is just this part, while freezing the polar somehow converges to zero strongly, okay? Is this part okay, clear? It's gonna be important in the proof then. I mean, in a sense, it's gonna be one of the key tricks in the proof.
Okay, so so basically, what we deduce is that mu of x zero r weak at the moment weakly converged to some sigma, which is of the form lambda mu, where lambda is just my polar. Okay. Moreover, since my uh, equation was homogeneous, if a mu equals zero forces a mu of x zero r to be zero, just uh, which implies that a of sigma is zero. Now, if lambda is not in the wave cone, so if the theorem is false, okay, sorry. Well, then sigma is absolutely continuous with the respect of back measure by what I said before. On the other hand, sigma is also the weak limit, basically by three. As I was saying, that the only thing which is responsible for the weak limit is this guy at singular point. So sigma is the weak limit of a dilation of the singular part. So basically what happens is that you take singular measure, you dilate those, and then you end up, so in a sense, the tangent measure of this family of singular measure of this singular measure is indeed a, a measure which is absolutely continuous with respect to the back measure. And you might hope that this gives you a contradiction, right? I started with singular measure, I zoom in, I get the regular, uh, an absolutely continuous measure, so at a, uh, um, at a lot of points. So this should give me a contradiction. That's unfortunately not the case. So there are examples of singular measure for which this procedure would nevertheless give you always um, a, a Delebeck measure. So in a sense, this process is too much. Um, I mean, you pass the, to the limit too much to, get, to, to be able to get the contradiction. So you have some structure some rigidity structure for the tangent measures, but you cannot improve this rigidity structure to, uh, to a contradiction just before passing to the limit because in a sense, the convergence is too weak, right? The point is that uh, the, um, singular measure can weakly converge to absolutely continuous measure. We all know example of this type. It's a bit more complicated to show that actually you can have an example of this type, even if this, all these singular measure are the same rescaling of a fixed one. Right. And an example of singular measure converging to absolutely continuous one, we all know. The point is that you want to build that example in such a way that this family of singular measure is the rescaled of a fixed one. That's what is more complicated, but it's nevertheless true. So, so this is not enough to get a contradiction. Okay. So in a sense, you should think to this like a rigidity theorem. Uh, sorry, uh, yeah, it is sort of, um, let's say, um, yeah, a rigidity theorem, which you need a bit to quantify in order to get the contradiction. And the good way to quantify this theorem is to sort of improve convergence, okay? And again, we are gonna rely on this idea that somehow since the polar is not in the wave cone, uh, what is happening is that we are gaining a tiny bit of ellipticity from the equation, which would allow to improve the convergence, okay? So, so maybe let me recap this thing. So the above is a rigidity theorem for tangent measure. Uh, we need to improve it. to a segmenting quotation mark um, um, quantitative, which is not going to be really quantitative, rigidity to get the contradiction. And the point is to improve convergence. So the key point is improving. This is going to be done by improving convergence. So we we will use ellipticity to improve convergence. Okay, this is the scheme of the proof. 
So let me uh, show how this works. Um, okay, so we know that a of mu x zero r is equal to zero. Well, now um, what is going to happen is that I can take. Uh, um, so I'm going to call lambda, which is my polar. And I'm assuming that this is not in the wave cone. OK? So basically, OK, maybe here I've been fast. But assume that the theorem is false. By contradiction, you're going to find a lot of points where the, the, the polar is not in the wave cone. And now I, I sort of start zooming in around one of these points on which all these limiting things, I mean, there is always an almost everywhere all around. So the point is that by contradiction, I can find enough point where I can do all of these. At, well, enough, at least one I need, but <laughs> there exists one. So I'm assuming that the polar is not in the wave cone and uh, that my zoom measure and that and then if I look to the my mu x zero r minus lambda, so I say I'm a, a radian longer subsequence, which I don't call because of the device. This is going to zero. So basically, I I, I can assume this truth. So the singular part here, and the third one is that the singular part is weakly converging to some sigma with sigma different from zero. OK, and uh, uh, basically, I can assume also what's not incumbent and sigma is absolutely continuous with respect to the bad measure. So basically, what I want now to show is that this sigma is um, so that this convergence. So the main goal here would be to show that this convergence is slightly better than weak so that I get a contradiction because a singular measure can weakly converge to an absolutely continuous one. But uh, uh, but that's it. I mean, if I improve the convergence, then these things should be singular. So now I, I would improve the convergence in this sense. So it's sort of L1 convergence. OK. So the goal would be, uh, let me write it. So the goal is then to improve the convergence. It's to show that. Uh, three will be improved into minus sigma, the total variation in B1 going to zero, and this is a contradiction. Is this clear? I mean, this uh, the scheme of the proof is okay. So do, is there any question at this level? Okay. So um, this eight. Okay. So uh, how can do this? Okay. So the first thing is that uh, I can I know that a of mu x zero is equal to zero. Well, now I'm trying to somehow substitute so I can look to a of so mu of x zero minus lambda mu singular x zero r is equal to uh, let's write this way <laughs> a of lambda mu singular x zero r, which is with my previous notation b lambda of mu singular x zero r. So this family of singular measure here is solving an equation somehow where I have a right hand side. But this operator, since I was able to somehow froze the polar before passing to the limit, well, this operator is now an elliptic operator. So if I call, but for simplicity, uh, sigma r, this family of measures, so that's. So basically, what I get is that b lambda of sigma r is equal to a of, let's call it uh, mm, nu r, where sigma r is singular. 
And the most important thing is that mu r is, is going to zero somehow in L1. Okay, so now this is an ellipt so this is an elliptic operator, right? So what and B lambda is elliptic. So what you would like to do is the following. So you say you write sigma r to be B lambda to the minus one A of new R, since B lambda is elliptic, since B lambda. and thus invertible. So basically you, you might expect at least if you think in terms of symbol that an elliptic operator should be invertible or at least invertible up to a very nice kernel. And so this is an operator of order K This is an operator. So it's the inverse of an operator of order K. So it should be an operator of order minus K. So this decomposition is an operator of order zero. So in a sense, you should expect that this term here to be somehow to have a, oops, to have a linear bound in terms of the quantity here. So we can expect, so by say naive analysis, We can expect that uh, sigma r should be bounded, for instance, in any L1 norm or LP norm being, well, that's not only naive, this, this would be also true, actually, by new r in LP for all p, okay, that's naive. So in particular, if p is equal one, We expect that sigma r of the wall ball to be bounded by new r of the wall ball, which somehow should go to zero by what we say. So this will tell us Wait, that- Guido, in the yes. chat there is a request to go back to the previous page for a moment, maybe to see the notation or- Yes. Is there any question uh, from the audience? Yeah, it's... I think no, they are they are happy. They have now seen. Okay. Mm -hmm. Sorry, is that I, yeah, I don't read the chat. <laughs> so okay, so th that's that's what you would expect. You already see that there are two problems. One which is a sort of um, negligible in a sense. So the first problem is that maybe these things are not really invertible. There is a kernel. On the other, so probably what you'd expect is that it's not sigma r which is bounded by this, but it's like the, 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 the sigma r minus some element in the kernel, which is sort of fine if you think, because uh, elements in the kernel should be good. So even if this guy is converging strongly to an element of the kernel, then it's nevertheless okay, because this is singular element in the kernel are nice. So, um, so, this would still give a contradiction. So okay, if- Quickly yes. ask myself that, why is this uh, also true for P equal to one? So you have this operator of order zero, which could be some Calderon Sigmon operator, and then it would not be bounded on L1, so. Yeah, yeah, indeed, that's that's the second issue, which is the serious one. <laughs> that's what I'm saying. So that, uh, that that's exactly, this. The, the first issue is this one about kernel, which is not so important and can be fixed easily. The second one is actually that this theorem is really false for P equal one. Okay, so this estimate here doesn't hold for P equal one. So one, let, let me give you the name. So star does not hold for P equal one. Okay, indeed, as you were saying correctly, B lambda, and I'll give you, uh, Sketch of this thing of this proof B lambda to the minus one times in lambda is a Calderon Zygmunt operator. And uh, uh, star fades for Calderon Zygmunt operator. 
So, so we need, so in a sense, a linear estimate is not enough. Okay. So, so the first issue is the kernel, and the second issue is indeed that uh, linear operator, they, uh, zero order operator, they do not map L1 into L1. Would be too nice as a, as a thing. Uh, basically, because of the existence of singular measures. So, so it seems you are stuck at this level. But there is a less tiny thing you can hope for, and I'll show you how, which is that somehow this measure here is uh, positive. So, sigma r is a positive measure. Okay, now if you have a positive measure which is weakly converging to zero, well, then this measure would uh, um, would need to strongly converge to zero, right? So in a sense, uh, what is going to happen in the proof is that we are going to sort of exploit this fact. OK, so, so this is main issue in the sketch of the proof. And the second, uh, somehow, second issue This is minor issue. Let's call it minor issue. B lambda is might have a kernel. So invert. Okay, so the second issue actually can be can be overcome by localization. Okay, so let phi be say a positive compactly supported function in B one. Say with phi identically one on B one alpha. Well, then uh, I sort of look to what is the equation satisfied by B lambda phi. Uh, what was my notation? Sigma, I think, yes. Now, these things is now compactly supported, right? So, in a sense, uh, uh, whatever is this operator, it's that now I can do the Fourier analytic uh, proof to show that basically this guy being compactly supported that with fin finite measure cannot lie in the kernel, so ca cannot have any component on the kernel. So here I can really invert the operator when I when I look to these things. So. So, but then this is like uh, uh, phi b lambda of sigma r, and then I have something like a commutator. Uh, but this is an operator of order k minus one, right? When, when you commute multiplication, that's just Leibniz rule, essentially. So there is one situation which all derivatives, it's this guy, and then there are situations in which derivatives goes mixed, but there, there are at most k minus one of derivatives here, right? So this is a nice object in a sense. So, so it's a nice reminder. K minus one at most. And then I keep doing, so this is equal, this is equal to, so phi b lambda of sigma r, we knew what it was, was a of nu r. And then I have this, okay. Sigma r. And now again, I might want to localize also nu r to be sure that, uh, to be sure that, um, I don't um, <clears throat> that I can take all Fourier transform and things like that. So I can write these things like phi a of phi nu r plus is plus There's another phi here and then apply it to new R. Okay, so the key point here is that all of these can be written like uh, uh, C applied to tau R, where C is an operator of order at most uh, K minus one.
and tau r is like bounded inner one. Okay, so it might either come from this term, which is bounded, or this term, which goes to zero, but I mean, the sum is still bounded. Okay, so uh, this, this term is really a reminder, or if you want, is what takes care of the kernel. Uh, so I, I won't dedicate too much of attention on this because this, this is an actual lower order term. So you see here you have an operator of order k, which is equal to something uh, uh, like another operator. So operator of order k applied to my measure is an operator of order k applied to something which is going to zero, plus an operator of order k minus one applied to something which is bounded. And that's the key structure we need. Okay. And all these operators, they do act indeed those things which are like compactly supported. Okay, so actually it means by, by the way, so since this involves just derivative here, you can put some, you, you can assume this thing to be compactly supported, okay? Um, so basically again, the, the key structure is the following. So B lambda phi sigma R is equal to uh, A of phi, new r plus c tau r okay um now if you take fourier transform what you get is that by lambda psi of a psi psi Okay. Now this is not zero. So, okay, this is a vector, remember. It's not zero. So basically I can, okay, cannot really divide, but I can multiply by its, um, by itself and then divide. Okay, so what I would get is something like phi sigma r psi is equal to psi applied to B lambda. Psi transpose divided by B lambda psi square is applied to P F nu R psi plus B lambda psi uh, star transpose six psi divided by Applied to tower. Now this is an op this is homogeneous so remember big lambda x is homogeneous of degree k, x is homogeneous of degree k, so this product is homogeneous of degree 2k, and this is homogeneous of degree 2k, so the ratio is homogeneous of degree zero. While this thing is homogeneous of degree k minus uh, minus one, basically. Uh, yeah. Okay. This I'm I'm a bit cheating here. So this is at most k minus one. So in, in a sense, you should divide this in its homogeneous component. But again, I'm saying this is a reminder. I don't want to do too much. So homogeneous of degree at least. It's least minus one. I might be minus, okay. I don't know if at least minus one is the right terminology, but whatever. So basically what I can do is that I can sort, sort so like uh, this is a symbol, which is in a sense you see should improve of one derivative. So I can multiply by Xi divided by Xi getting something which is homogeneous of degree uh, zero then. Uh, is it? Yes. Sorry, I can divide here by psi, multiply by psi, and so getting something which is homogeneous of degree zero, while this one is like uh, uh, gaining derivatives. Okay, so now what we need is basically the following version of Ormander Millen theorem. I hope I'm writing correctly, which goes as following. So let's so infinity function and um, 
and let d mu of far of f be this operator, which is you make the anti so anti Fourier transform of m psi applied to the Fourier transform of f. Okay, so it's a multiplier operator on the Fourier side. Then if m is homogeneous of degree one. Sorry, of degree zero and smooth. Oh, yeah, okay, smooth was already. Then uh, PM maps LP into LP for P larger than one, and TM maps L1 into L1 infinity, which is the weak L1 space, which is the set of function F such that if you look to the supremum over lambda of lambda times the measure where f is larger than lambda, this is bounded. Okay, so this is a space which is weaker than L1. The measure where f, the measure where f is larger than lambda, this is bounded. So this space is smaller than L1, uh, sorry, is larger than L1. So it's, uh, it's a weaker space, but that's the best you can hope for. <laughs> because again, this is to be a calderon sigmund operator. And the second thing is that actually is a consequence of the first one and some, that if M is homogeneous of degree minus one, if you want minus L, then TM maps L1 into L1 is compact. Okay, so it maps uh, L1 bounded sequences into L1 convergence sequences, up, up to subsequences. Okay, so basically the point is that uh, it, it's actually stronger what you would get. So you're gaining a derivative now. Right? So you like end up in a sobolev space, a sort of sobolev space which embeds compactly into L1. Okay, so okay, maybe I'm a bit cheating here. The point is that uh, all, all that's true if all the things I'm considering as like fixed compact support, so support for fixed uh, containing a fixed compact set, uh, which is the case for our situation. Okay, so don't use this theorem as it's written because it's probably not completely wrong, uh, correct, but it gives you why right. in, in the case we are interested, it can be applied like that. Okay, but now you see that basically, uh, if I anti Fourier transform these things, what I would get from here is like a compact, a, a sequence of things which is compact in a pre compact in L1. And what I would get from here is something which is bounded in L1 infinity in terms of the L1 norm of this guy, which is going to zero. Zero in L1 infinity. Okay, so basically, here now what I would get is that phi sigma r can be written as right this way, fr plus gr, where gr is precompact in L1. Strong. And gr. And fr is going to zero in L1 infinity. And in particular, um, in measure. So meaning that the measure where FR is larger than lambda goes to zero for all lambda positive. Okay. And uh, and moreover, there is the third thing is that FR is going to zero weekly star as a distribution. Okay, that's that's basically because it's an operator applied to something which goes to zero. Okay, that's uh, if you look 
So this guy is going to zero in distribution, and this is an operator uh, applied to it. So if you if you take a test function, you can move this operator to the test function, and this is going to zero. And the operator applied to this function is nice. Okay. So so you're now getting one, two, and three. And my claim is that, moreover, okay, there is a four, which may be stupid, that sigma phi sigma r is positive. And my claim is that if you combine one, two, three, and four, so claim one plus two plus three plus four implies that phi sigma r is precompact in L1. Which which gives the final contradiction. Okay, maybe in the last two minutes I'll tell you why it's. Uh, I should finish in three minutes. Is correct? Yeah, I'm sure that you can take five minutes if you need. No, no, I think I, I need just. Uh, I can do it in three minutes. <laughs> okay, the key point is the following. So, uh, so FR, so let's look to this equation here. Let's see if I can do it. Okay, but I wanted to copy it. Okay, let's write this uh, equation. So phi sigma r is equal to FR plus GR. And these things is positive. So this implies that this guy, shouldn't have that much of a big negative part. So this implies that the negative part of FR, which is the max, I think is the right, minus FR and zero, uh, is bounded by GR. But now this guy is uh, going to is is compact in L one strong, so in particular is equi integrable. So this guy should be equi integrable as well. So F R minus is equi integrable, so it cannot concentrate. Now you have a sequence of functions which are equi integrable and which are going to zero in measure. So say up to subsequence, you can imagine pointwise. Okay. So things are equi-integrable and they go to zero point-wise. Then it's an easy application of Vitali theorem to show that this goes to zero in L1 indeed. Right? Because basically you can use losing theorem, for instance. Except for a set of small measures, they're going to zero uh, uniformly because point-wise they're going to zero. Well, and on the set of small measure, so uniformly, so in particular in L1, and on the set of small measure, they cannot put any L1 norm because they are equi-integrable. They are bounded by something which is uh, which is convergent. So on that set, they cannot put any L1 norm. So L1 norm cannot concentrate on that small set, so it has to go to zero. Okay, so this implies that if R negative, but it's not a minus one, negative goes to zero strongly in L1. But now back here. So now let's try. So the second, uh, so this, um, the second key step here is that now these things are going to zero as as distribution. Okay. So going to zero as a distribution is like means going to zero in average. Okay. So the integral is like going to zero. But if the integral of the negative part is going to zero and the integral is going to zero, well, the integral of the positive part should go to zero as well. Okay. So there is. It might happen that you go to zero in, in, in average, but not go to zero in L1, because basically you are very, very positive and very, very negative. But if in a sense you cannot be very, very negative, you shouldn't be as well very, very positive, right? But since, let me, I mean, you, can, you can use test function for that, but I don't want. So since, uh, what would be, FR is going to zero as a distribution, then the integral of fr is going to zero. And this is the integral of the positive part minus the integral of the negative part. This is going to zero as well. So this tells you that the integral of the positive part is going to zero, which implies so both positive and negative is going to zero. So the integral with absolute value is going to zero. 
So FR is going to zero strongly in L1, which is what was missing. So this implies that phi sigma r, which is equal to FR plus GR, is precompact in L1. Right? Because this guy is precompact, this guy goes to zero. Which is what we want to prove. Okay. So I think this concludes the proof, and I think I'm almost in time. <laughs>